Hey guys, Sam Miller from Panel Precision. This video is going to be all about bullet seating depths. I'll go over COAL versus CBTO and I'll show you how I get consistent and accurate measurements with a Horner D lock and load overall length gauge. Okay, I already have a couple of bullet seating videos on the YouTube channel there. Uh, one of them was part of the load development series that I put together last year. This video isn't going to go over all of the bullet seating depths again. Uh, in fact, most of it's going to focus on actually using this cartridge or this overall length gauge and how to get consistent and repeatable and the most accurate measurements you can with it. Before I get started on that, we'll just do a little recap real quick. Uh, go over cartridge overall length, COAL, and cartridge based ogive length. Now, cartridge overall length is literally the the distance between the case head out to the tip of the bullet and it is the only spec you're going to get in a reloading manual. Uh, cartridge based ogive length is the measurement between the case head to where the ogive which is the curved shape of the bullet runs into the bearing surface which is the full diameter of the bullet and what that does is it gives us a measurement of pretty close to where the bullet's going to touch the rifling. So we can use this along with the cartridge overall length tool to tell us how far off the lands our loaded rounds are. You can't do that by measuring from end to end. You just can't. Uh, you know, bullet manufacturing, and, and this is not just on hollow tip or hollow point bullets like this Match King, but even the, the polymer tipped ones like uh, Acubons or ELDs from Hornady are all going to have a little bit of variation on that nose length. Uh, you know, the more relevant measurement here is the cartridge based ogive length because we can actually apply that to something. Uh, the only reason you really need to know cartridge overall length is if you're working within uh, magazine limitations, length limitations. So anyway, I, I go off of cartridge based ogive length. If you see any of my load notes on targets or anything like, anything's like that. In fact, right here in this box, this is Jake's ammunition. That number right there, that 2.127 is a cartridge based to ogive length. So it's measured with this comparator to there. Now if I were to measure that as a cartridge overall length, 2.8575. Now I actually watched Jake load these and I kind of looked over his shoulder to make sure he's doing everything right. So I know that every one of those rounds, all 40 of those, are within one thousandth of each other cartridge based ogive length. But if you were to measure all 40 of those with a caliper end to end, you'd probably come up with 40 different measurements or a whole bunch of different measurements. So it's just not a good way to have consistent hand loaded ammunition. Uh, I know guys do it. I know guys sit there at their press and their, you know, their, their seating bullets and they're measuring overall length and adjusting their die every single time to make that overall length come out the same. It's actually making your ammo worse, so don't do it that way. Uh, you, are, you are better off if you just set up your size or your seating die and just seat the bullets randomly, check one or two to make sure that you're fitting inside your magazine, but don't go off your cartridge overall length for every one of your reloads and adjust your seating die to accommodate it. What you're doing is you're just making the bullet seat further in and further out for each individual round. So I'll give you a demonstration real quick with five of these. Okay, so let's do a real quick de demonstration on why the using a cartridge-based ogive measurement is more accurate and more consistent than using a cartridge overall length measurement as far as coming up with our seating depth for the most consistently consistency out of our hand loads. So what I did was I went, I went ahead and mounted my comparator and with the insert for 2.6, so this, the, the diameter of this insert is pretty close to 2.64. It's just a little bit smaller so that it contacts the bullet and doesn't slide right over the bearing surface. So this is a, a Sinclair setup, but Hornady makes similar ones with the aluminum inserts. So when we put it on an electronic caliper, which is how I recommend it, we turn it on and then we zero it for our comparator. So now the distance between here and the comparator is zero. So I'm going to pull five of them out of here, just random. The seating depth on this is supposed to be 2.127.
This is one of my son Jake's first batches by himself, so we'll see how he did. So he's five ten thousandths off on that one. I'll just pull him out of here randomly. That one's right on the money, 2.127. So he's one thousandth off on this one, 2.126. Which, by the way, is about as far as I want to go. It's about a thousand. Same with that one. Same with that one. So he is. He's running about one thousandths shorter than what they should be uh, across those five except for one, and then he had one at five ten thousandths off. So the total spread on all five of these is one thousandth of an inch as far as the distance between the case head and where that bullet's going to first, you know, if you had it loaded to the lands, it's only going to be one thousandths of difference between all five of those. So to compare that, let's just take a overall length measurement. So we'll zero the caliper again. Now it's just measuring between the anvils. Two point eight five nine five. Two point eight five three five. There's six thousandths. Two point eight five three five. Those are pretty close to each other. 2.8555, there's two thousandths difference between those two. And 2.8605. So what we have about a six and a half thousand, seven thousandths difference between the whole lot. Quite a bit more. So if you were sitting there adjusting your seating die to, you know, off based off those overall length measurements, what you'd end up with is, you know, all these bullets, except for the two that were pretty close together would all be different jumps from the case to the lands in your rifling, which is not conducive to low ES and consistent accurate hand loads. So, uh, you know, the two measurements, by far the better one is cartridge-based ogive as far as getting the most accuracy and consistency out of your hand loads. Okay, so to measure the dimension inside of our barrel or our chamber to come up with our max CBTO, cartridge-based ogive length, I like to use an overall length gauge. Now, this is the Stony Point model of this, you know, I've had this since the 90s, and I think Hornady bought all Stony Point stuff, so now this is now known as the Hornady Lock and Load Overall Length Gauge. It's the same thing. And what this is is just an aluminum rod, that's threaded on the end that accepts what they call modified cases that take the place of a cartridge case in your chamber and they thread onto the end of the overall length gauge and there's a flat machined into the end of the gauge here that lets your caliper anvil sit in there and touch the end of the case now there's a nylon rod here with a thumb screw that locks it in place that slides in and out and what that does is it pushes the bullet through the modified case until it contacts the rifling in your barrel. So it looks kind of like this. Let's say that's the end of it there. This thumb screw locks it down so it doesn't move. And then we measure from here to here using our insert and the anvil on our, on our caliper. So it's a pretty slick system and it's uh, it's pretty consistent for what it is especially considering that humans are doing all of the pushing and the shoving in here to make all that happen but anyway I'll go over how I use this how I get the most accurate measurements that I can and how I stay consistent with it alright guys here's the third take on this video and probably the whole reason that I felt like I needed to make this video and that has to do with the modified case so the modified case is the piece that we're using to thread onto that overall length gauge tool that uh, you know gives us a 
a way of filling up the chamber, holding a bullet, and then pushing the bullet out till it touches the lance. So what the modified case does is it, it just replaces our cartridge case in the chamber. Now when you buy one of these brand new, they come threaded, they're, they're drilled out and tapped there on the end, and they're threaded to go on that tool, and the necks are expanded, I believe, I think Hornady expands them two thousandths over bullet diameter. So what that gives you is a case neck that a bullet can just slide through easily. So it'll fall out end to end, which is very important for getting consistent measurements with the tool. Now here's where it gets tricky, and this is probably why I got so many emails and I have to do this video again. You can make your own modified case. What I do now, now that, now that I have the tools and the, the opportunity you know, in the shop and all that stuff with my lathe, it's very easy for me. I can just fire a case in the chamber and then I drill it out. I first back up, I run it through my body die or one of my Redding Type S bushing dies. I take the bushing out so it doesn't touch the neck at all because remember we need that bullet to slide freely in there. But I size the body and I bump the shoulder back two thousandths. I basically do to what is going to be my modified case everything except size the neck uh, to replicate exactly what I'm going to be reloading. So this is an Alpha Munitions case that I fired in Jake's new 260 here and then I ran it through my Type S bushing die with the bushing and the decapping rod and all that stuff taken out of it. I did exactly to this case what I do to all of my cases and what Jake will be doing to all of his cases in the future which is size it in my Redding die bump it back two thousands this is exactly the same piece of brass that Jake is running in his rifle and then all I did was I chucked it up in my lathe I drilled it out and I tapped it 5 16 36 to thread onto the end of the overall length gauge so at the end of that Jake's hand loads these pieces of brass right here, which is our alpha munitions, uh, these are brand new cases, but when he runs them through the sizing die, these will be exactly the same as the modified case for the barrel. Now, the difference between a new piece of alpha brass and a sized or fired, actually, let's back it up. The difference between a new piece of alpha brass and a fired piece of alpha brass in Jake's chamber is only three thousandths. So from the end of the case to the shoulder datum line which is how we're measuring it there's only three thousandths of stretch in that first firing and we bumped it back two thousandths <laughs> so the difference if I were to take a brand new piece of alpha brass chuck it up in my lathe drill it out uh, run the tap in there and then expand the neck two thousandths so that I get the the bullet to slide freely in there the difference between the two is only one thousandths of an inch it's not even something to think about uh, when I do all my seating depth changes and all that stuff, I work with ten thousandths dimensions. So, you know, while my seating depths are all within one thousandths of each other, as far as a batch of ammo goes, when I start adjusting, looking for the, you know, the best accuracy or whatever, I'm going in ten thousandths increments. I don't mess around one or two thousandths. It's a big waste of time. Uh, you know, with the tools that we have and the way we measure everything, you aren't going to see a difference in one thousandths or two thousandths of jump. You just aren't. So, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter at all when I'm using this brass in that chamber, whether I use a new piece of brass or a fired piece of brass. But, from an accuracy standpoint, meaning the tool's accuracy, not my hand load's accuracy, the tool's accuracy, the modified case and a fired case out of Jake's rifle that's been run through a sizing die and is sitting in the loading block waiting for the next batch of powder and my, seating, my bullets to be seated in it are going to be exactly the same. So the tool I'm using is as accurate as I can make it as a representation to the case I'm using. So with that all said, you don't have to have a custom modified case to come up with an accurate hand load for your rifle. Your rifle doesn't care if you use a modified case that's been fired in it or a brand new one you just bought at Sportsman's Warehouse. It just doesn't matter. What matters is that you find the seating depth and you use the same tools so that you have consistency in measuring and then you seat every bullet to exactly the same dimension, whatever that number was that you came up with. Uh, I will say that the whole reason that I made a big deal about it is that if you take a fired case, run it through your sizing 
uh, die, drill it and tap it, and use it as your modified case, your dimension is going to be longer than it should be for a brand new piece of brass. The difference might not matter. So the Alpha Brass was only, you know, after it went through the brand new, fired, bumped, the difference is only one thousandth of an inch. Not going to matter at all. But this new piece of brass, you know, this new one, the one that I bought commercially a long time ago for 260 Remington, is a piece of Remington brass. And it is absolutely different. It's six thousandths different from a fired alpha piece of brass that's been sized through my Redding die. Six thousand. So if you want to run five thousandths off the lands with your 400 pieces of new piece, you know, pieces of brass or whatever, and your case, say you're running, say you, you shoot a piece of Remington brass in your chamber, it grows seven or eight thousandths in your chamber, you bump it back two thousandths in your sizing die, that will be an exact representation of how you're going to run all your fire brass in the future, but it's still going to be six thousandths longer than all of the remaining new pieces of brass that you have to cycle through to get there. So if you're running five off and you go right off of your fire dimension brass, when we go to do this measurement, you're actually going to be touching the lands or into them a little bit. So from a safety standpoint, that's why I made a big deal about it. Uh, I don't like to run up pressure in the lands and I, I want to know what I'm working with. So if I'm trying to stay off the lands the entire time, I want to make sure I'm doing that. And by using a fired case and then understanding the difference in dimensions between a fired case and a new case, I can accomplish that. So what I do is I check my comparator, my bump gauge between the fired one and the new one, and then I accommodate that in my seating depth. So if I was stretching eight thousandths with alpha brass in this chamber and only bumping it back two, that leaves me with a six thousandths difference between a new piece of brass and a fire piece of brass. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add that six thousandths into the case. I'm going to make it six thousandths shorter if I'm using a fired modified case. And that will get me right where I'm going to be with a new piece of brass. Uh, <laughs> and I can listen to myself say all this and I know that I'm not making any sense. But look at it this way. When we go to measure, you'll be able to see it a lot easier. But when you push this piece of new brass into the chamber, whether you're using the tool, we're actually using our hand to hold it up against the chamber shoulder wall right here, and we're measuring the lands out here, it's exactly the same as if you take this new piece of brass and your bolt head is touching the end of it. It's not actually bottoming out on your bolt face. It is being held in place by your ejector, which is spring-loaded, so it's pushing that up against the shoulder of your chamber wall. And when you fire it, this whole thing stretches back and stops on the bolt face. So it compresses the ejector plunger into the bolt. When you bump it, you're only bumping it a couple of thousands to make sure that that chambers easily the next time. But you still have a dimensional change there. So the second time around, if you measured it, let's back up and forget about CBTO for a minute. If you had a cartridge overall length measurement that was from the head to the tip of the bullet and then you stretch that case out six thousandths and then you seat the next one exactly the same way with the same bullet it's going to be six thousandths shorter, it's going to be six thousandths further in because it's going to follow the length of that case if you want the same measurement. So if you want to maintain the same relationship between the shoulder and the throat which are the only things that don't change until the throat erodes then you need to take into account how much it stretched back here. Uh, and then I'm done. I'm just done talking about that. You know, maybe I'll show you a little bit more when we start to measure it, but in the grand scheme of things, as long as you understand how much it stretches, and you know, you're going to have to decide whether or not you want to mess with a modified case that's been shot in your own barrel, or if you just want to buy one right off the shelf. It doesn't matter. Your, your barrel won't care. It won't make your ammo more accurate. Uh, you know, everything that comes after that is much more important than whether or not your modified case was fired in the chamber. Uh, it's definitely more convenient for me because I can just shoot it, boom, it's all right there. I don't have to go somewhere and try to buy a modified case. Try to buy one in Coeur d'Alene for a 6547. It just doesn't happen. You got to order it. So 
Uh, my 6547 barrel I spun up last year, bang, 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 fire a few rounds through it, make sure it all works right, throw it in the lathe, do my thing, and I've got a modified case. I don't have to order one. But if you have access and you're shooting a 308 or a 30 odd 6 or a 270 or even a 260 Remington, you're probably a 65 Creedmoor, you'll probably be able to buy one right off the shelf. So it might not make any difference. You might not want to. Uh, no, I don't do that on my lathe for people, so no, you can't send it in to me. Uh, if you want to use a fired custom modified case, you can fire them and send them off to Hornady, and they will do the drilling and tapping for a fee. I would recommend that you run it through your body die first. They tell you not to run it through a sizing die, but I think that's because they don't want people sizing the neck, because they don't want to have to go through the expanding and all that junk again. But if you run it through your body die so that they get the case, they drill it, they tap it, they send it back to you, uh, that should be all right. And that's how I would do it, and that's how I'll show you when we get into using this tool why it's important to run it through a sizing die. Okay, let's jump right into this. Uh, first thing you need to do is take your bolt out. So I'm going to drop that cheek piece. This is kind of cool. This is Jake's rifle, so it's left-hand action, so the port's right here. So you get the bolt out. Uh, you're going to want to make sure your chamber's clean. What I usually do is I just take a patch, run her up in there, and just make sure the chamber to the, the shoulder is clean. Now, I have tested this a little bit as far as cleaning the barrel. You know, if you're watching my videos, you know I'm not a big fan of cleaning the barrel every time I go shoot. But uh, I have cleaned this, not this barrel, but I have cleaned them in the past where I, I take it down to metal. I clean it all the way to do my uh, throat erosion measurement at whatever, you know, however many rounds down the tube. And I have tested it where I didn't touch it other than cleaning the chamber like I just showed you. And then cleaned the barrel all the way down and actually looked at it with a bore scope to make sure it was clean. And man, I just, I, there wasn't enough difference in the measurement to, for me to tell you to do it one way or the other. But I will tell you, keep that chamber clean. Okay, same thing with the modified case. You want to make sure there's nothing on the modified case. Uh, the reason for all that is that when we start to do these measurements, you're going to want to make sure that everything is the same and everything is representing what your case is going to look like, like I was telling you with the modified cases. You want this to replicate what your loaded round is like. To get there, we need to make sure that this modified case seats fully against the chamber wall. So the shoulder of the case needs to be contacting the end of the chamber, just like a loaded round does. The reason for that is if you take a case, and this is why it's important if you use a fired case to run it through your sizing die first, you want this to go into your chamber and stop against the, the chamber shoulder. You don't want it to hang up back here on the web of the case. And if you take a fired case that has grown enough back here in the web, and you don't run it through your sizing die before you use it for a modified case, it can hang up back here in the chamber. We don't want that because it's hard to control how much it's hanging up. So when we push that in there, before you even do the bullet, push it in and make sure you can hear that tapping against the end of your chamber wall. You want it to go in and stop so that every time you push it in there, you can make it exactly the same. So once we've confirmed that it will go in there, now, for the record, if you use a new modified case, like this one, I had never seen one of those not just fall right into the chamber. They're very easy to use. You don't even hardly have to worry about that. But Anyway, so here we have our modified case. We're getting ready to take our measurement. We confirm that the bullet slides in and out, doesn't catch on anything. You don't want that catching on anything. We're going to start pretty deep. We're just going to push that whole thing right into the chamber. And we're going to use our hands and we're going to make sure that that is seating up against the end of the chamber. And then we just loosen the thumb screw and we're going to push it in until it stops. You don't have to push it hard. And you're going to hold it in place so that the case is pushed in 
and this has you know pressure on the back of the bullet so everything is held in place here and can't move. And then you lock your thumb screw down and then you pull this out. Now a lot of times, in fact more often than not, at least with the pressure that I use, which isn't very much, the bullet will stick into your rifling right here. So all I do is I flip the gun upside down. This isn't probably going to be very elegant on video, but and I just give it a sharp wrap on the bench and the bullet comes out. Boom. So this is what the chamber looks like. This is our dimension right here and I'm going to measure from the case head to the end of the ogive where it starts to turn into the bearing surface with my uh, comparator insert. So to do that we're going to clamp this on here, clamp it down, turn it on, zero it out, I'm going to put it on that flat, make sure everything's squared up, wiggle it back and forth, make sure I got a good reading here, 2.1405. So now what I'm going to do I'm going to keep really good notes on this and I'm going to write down that measurement and then what I'll do is I'll take two more just like that and I'll write them down and I'll see what I get alright so there's our third let's see what we get with this third Two point one four one zero. All right. So I have all three measurements written down. We're going to call that one forty two Sierra Match King fired mod case Jake two sixty. He has 180 rounds on it or so. Okay, so I just write those down. So those are the three measurements I just took on this using the same bullet, same case, same technique. You can see that I'm, what, uh, 1,000 spread between all three of them. So I'll just look at that and say, yeah, the max CBTO on this right now is 2.141. That's my max CBTO right now at 180 rounds on Jake's 260 with 142 grain match king and a fired modified case. And that will all get written into the load book, into his, you know, the book where we keep all of our load data and our barrel log and all that stuff. What I'll do is I'll take that particular bullet, this match king, I'll put it in a little Ziploc baggie with a modified case and keep them, mark them as Jake's 260. And this is the exact combo that I'll use when I go to check for throat erosion or whatever in a thousand rounds. Uh, that way I know that the exact same bullet and the exact same case and the same techniques are used every time. I'll take three measurements, I'll just take the average as long as they're close. Now if one of these is way off from the other two, do it again and see what you come up with. In my experience, this is normal. You shouldn't have a bunch of different readings. They should be really close because everything is exactly the same and it all relies on your technique. So, uh, you know, the big thing again is to make sure that that case is bottoming out in the chamber. You need to, you need to hear that tapping. You can hear it when it hits the end of the chamber. You make sure your chamber is clean, make sure the case is clean, make sure all of your measuring tools are clean. It would blow your mind to see what a, a little flake of carbon or a piece of a cleaning patch or whatever can do to your measurements. So make sure everything's clean so that you have good contact among all the, the contact points. Make sure the case bottoms out and make sure you're using the same amount of pressure every time you push the bullet into the lens and that you hold everything in place when you lock this down. You should come up with the same numbers. Okay, another thing you can run into is uh, different brands of bullets, even if it's the same weight, can give you different measurements in here. And I think what it has to do with is the angle 
the shape of the ogive where it contacts the rifling in the barrel. So that rifling where it's cut with the reamer isn't a square cut. So what you end up with is a little bit of an angle. So I think what's happening is the angle of the bullets, even though you know our measuring tool is going to be hitting them pretty close to where it turns into the, the full diameter of the bullet, but it can't be right at it, simply because you don't want it to slip over it. Uh, so I think what's happening is you have a little bit different angle on the nose of that bullet, especially right where it, it, it turns into the bearing surface, and then the angle of the cut inside your throat is a little bit different. And it's been my experience that the Match Kings, the 142 grain Match Kings, will give you a slightly longer CBTO number. Now, it doesn't matter. You can you know, adjust your seating depth according to whichever bullet you're using. And what I've found in the past is I'll get a bunch of different, say, 140 uh, grain class bullets that'll be within a couple or three thousandths of each other of CBTO. Last year, if you saw the load development series videos, I did a video where I checked all of them that I had on hand, and there was a bunch of them in there that were pretty close to, to each other. And then at the end of the day on that uh, video, I loaded all of those bullets to exactly the same CBTO. In other words, when I, when I did my, my load up on them through the sizing or through the seating die, I just seated all the bullets to the same CBTO. And in, in reality, what was happening is the jumps were all just a little bit different from all those different brands of bullets, but the jumps on each individual brand of bullet were kept within a thousandth of each other. So what I found out was that, uh, number one, again, seating depth isn't as critical as people make it out to be as far as uh, accuracy goes. If you have a good barrel and it likes the bullets you're shooting through it, you have a really broad... Uh, range of seating depths that you can use with that bullet. So uh, what I found was all those different brands of bullets, even though they're the same uh, weight and the same style of bullet, could be shot at all different depths and still shoot well. And not only that, but they all shot to the same point of impact. It was pretty cool. But anyway, let's run this ELD through real quick. I'll do the same thing just to show you. 2.133 on the first reading with an ELD. That is exactly seven thousandths or eight thousandths uh, shorter than the Sierra Match King. So that means that the Match King, the angle of this 142 grain Match King, allows it to go eight thousandths further in as measured with my tool when I contact the lands. So if I was going to say I want to run both these bullets ten thousandths off the lands, then I'm just going to do that. The Match King, I know I need to go at 2.131, and the ELDs, I need to go at 2.123. In reality, I could probably run both of them at 2.125, and they'd probably shoot really well. Uh, that might be where we ended up with this. That might be why they're at 2.127. I just don't remember. I know we've been working with the Match King more, so uh, if I had to guess, I would say we were aiming for a 15 thousands off the lands or 20 off the lands or 10 off the lands or something like that. But as I brought up before, it doesn't really matter what your specific seating depth is as long as all of them are seated to that length. But this is how I check. This is how I look to see what my maximum cartridge-based ogive dimension can be. And then I track my barrel erosion that way. Now, if you watch the 260 build up last year and the load development when we started that I think I was at 2.060 really short throat on it uh, at 1480 rounds I was at 2.122 so you know <laughs> 60 thousandths in 1400 rounds uh, this barrel this chamber is used I use the same reamer except I, I use a throating reamer to punch it out a little bit You can use, a, say, a wooden dowel, or if you're really careful, you can use your cleaning rod if you don't want to do the bounce test on the back. Uh, I just prefer to bounce them. If I wasn't doing the video, I'd do it right there on the, the carpeted floor by the camera. All right, so this is our third measurement with our Hornady ELD, and we have 2.1345. 
So the second and third measurement are identical. And it's only one and a half thousandths different than the first one. So while I have this all out and about, let's do something real quick. This was my fired and sized modified case. Those three measurements were within one and a half thousandths across all three measurements. So I'll just do one with this. This is a new Hornady modified case that I bought right off the rack. Using the same ELD. Okay, you can really see that that bottoms out way easier. Alright, so we loosen her up, push in until they get contact, hold the case in place, hold the bullet in place, tighten the thumb screw down. Bullet stuck. Two point one two six. See the difference between a fired modified case and another brand new case. So it's a Remington case versus an Alpha case, and it's a brand new case versus a fired case. So two point one two six. We'll write that down too. Okay, guys. Here are my notes from my uh, checking CBTO on this barrel. You can see this is 142 grain match king. I took three readings off of that. It's all within thousands of each other, so you just pick one of them and run with it. Uh, same thing with the Hornady the ELD. I didn't change anything at all. I used the same fired modified case, same barrel, same round count on the barrel. So the two bullets are obviously getting different measurements because of that throat angle. Now, what happened when we went to the new modified case and checked it with, 100, with 140 grain ELD again? Now you can see my, you know, my error was what one and a half thousandths across three of those, and only one of them came up a little short. I took one reading with this at 2.126 with a new case, so there's a seven thousandths difference between a fired and bumped back two thousandths Alpha Munitions case that I turned into a modified case, and a brand new piece of Remington brass that Hornady turned into a modified case. So you can see the difference between the two. Now, I'm not the best artist, but let's see if we can do a little illustration here. So this, this is the case head, this is the shoulder where it turns into an angle, and this is where the lands and the barrel start. So we took our measurements with a new modified case at 2.126. If we fire that case so that it's the same dimensions as a fired modified case, it will be 2.133. So if it, the reason that this all matters is because where we take our measurements. If we were taking our measurements here to here, nothing would ever change. But because we're taking our measurements from the case head to the, the ogive, where the ogive turns into the bearing surface, this is definitely going to change from new to fired. So if we say Okay, we, we use a new modified case. Our max CBTO is 2.126. I want to put it right on the lands. Okay? So we load up our rounds uh, with all of our new cases. We shoot it. It shoots just lights out. It's just awesome. Best shooting round ever, right on the lands. Everything's peachy door. Everything's cool. Then we have all fire brass after that. We run them all through our sizing die, bump them all two thousandths. Go to load that load up again, and all of a sudden our velocities are different. It doesn't shoot as tight anymore. We're trying to figure out what's going on. You know what? I just did everything exactly the same as I did when the brass was new. Why is it not shooting well all of a sudden? Well, if you made them all 2.126, you aren't actually on the lands anymore. Now you're actually seven ten or seven thousandths off the lands. So if your barrel needed that bullet to be on the lands, it ain't there anymore because now your brass is stretched out even though you bumped it back two thousandths it's still seven thousandths difference from here to here now the safety part I was talking about before if you did it the opposite direction which means you do like I do and you fire a case and then you get it made into a modified case you take your CBTO measurement you say there it is 
it's the exact opposite. If our lands are at 2.133 with a fired case, a new piece of brass, because we're measuring it here, the max is only 2.126, so we're actually seven thousandths into the lands. And that was my whole point with the safety thing, is if you're gonna run up pressure tests and everything, I prefer to do them off the lands. But anyway, <laughs> I'm sure I could probably do a better job than that, but that is it in a nutshell right there. That is the difference. All your growth in a case, as far as we can measure it with the caliper, is gonna be measured back here on the end of the case. So, you know, that got longer. That to there didn't get longer. It stayed the same, but that got longer. And because we're measuring from here to wherever our comparator hits that bullet, we have to take into account there if we want to be exact. Okay, the only times I haven't been able to get consistent measurements, in other words, it was really tripping me up where I couldn't understand why was I getting all these different numbers when I was doing the same thing, you know, it shouldn't work that way. The only time that's happened has been when I haven't been able to get full contact with this case up into the chamber. Now, when I first started making modified cases, I'd just fire them. In fact, for two barrels, I just fired them and then uh, opened the neck up a little bit because my neck clearance in my chamber wasn't enough to let the bullet just slide through. I mean, you could push it through, but it wouldn't just fall in. So I'd open up the neck a little bit inside, and then I would drill and tap them, and I thought I had it in there, but what I was doing was I was getting the case in there, and it felt like it was in there the same way every time, but it wasn't. It was hanging up on the web, because it's a, you know, if you, if you put a fired case in this chamber, and then put your pinky in there and push it in, you'll feel it stop long before you feel it hit the end of the chamber. Just because the web has grown a little bit, you know, and it, 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 it still fits in the chamber, but not easily. But when you push your bolt in, there's a lot of camming action there, and you'll never feel it. You, you know, it, you just won't feel it. So, the only time I've had that happen is when my case didn't contact the end. A couple of times I had junk on the shoulder. Uh, other times I've had crap up in the chamber. And when I take one measurement, it would be there. When I pull that case out, the stuff fell off. So the next one that went in there, it wasn't there anymore. So... Uh, over the years, I've learned you want to have that go in there, bottom out against the chamber, the same way every single time. And if you do that and work on your technique a little bit, you don't want to, you know, muscle man one of the bullets in and the next time just do this on the end. You want to do this the same way every time so that the bullet makes contact with the lands the same way every time. But as long as you do that and you make sure that case bottoms up against the chamber, you should be within one or two thousandths with every one of your measurements. So uh, that's just something to think about. Now I do get a lot of questions from guys about seating depths in general. I will tell you that uh, you know you have to put this in perspective. This is a custom rifle with a reamer that I ordered that was specially designed so that I could run a 140 grain Burger Hybrid in a 260 Remington out of a stock AI mag, an Accuracy International magazine. So it, the overall length needed to be like 2.820 to make sure that you know all the bullets would slide in and out, out of the magazine easily. Well, that gave me a really stupid short throat. Uh, in hindsight, I wouldn't do that again, but that's what I ended up with. So my considerations were magazine length, my maximum cartridge overall length, as well as being able to seat that bullet at the lands or 10 thousandths off the lands and maximize all of my magazine space. Uh, you, you can't always do that with factory gun. I get a lot of guys emailing me about what do I do? I want to do this right and make precision rounds, but I, I, you know, this doesn't make any sense to me. The bullet's almost falling out of the case when I go to the lands. Yes, everything is different. All the manufacturers have different reamers, different freeboards, different throat specs, different jump, different... Everything is different, unfortunately. There are no single measurements. Uh, the only thing that stays the same are the, the dimensions of the case you can work with, so the neck length. I mean, literally, that's all that stays the same because all the bullets are different. They have different length bearing surfaces. They have different length nose sections. They have different length. Every, everything is different. 
142 grain Match King is different than the 140 grain Match King. Uh, the 140 grain Hybrid is different than the 140 grain VLD. They're all different. So let's take a look at a SAMI spec 260 Remington. This is out of what, fifth edition of the Sierra Rifle and Handgun Reloading Data Book. This is for a 260 Remington 142 grain Match King. Cartridge overall length, according to this reloading manual, is 2.765. Jake's rifle to the lands is almost a hundred thousandths longer than that. In fact, it is. It's over a hundred thousandths longer than that. So when you go off of these numbers, these are these are how they built this data. So what they don't tell you here, I don't. Maybe they do in the main section of the book. They don't tell you what barrel did they use. Uh, what was the twist rate on that barrel? What was the temperature that day? What was the brand of the barrel? Is it a cut rifled? Is it a button rifled? There's all kinds of variables in reloading, so don't get hung up on having to use that number. That's the beauty of reloading. I do get questions about how far out can I seat it in the case and still have it work right. Now, I read somewhere long ago that you're supposed to have a caliber in the neck. Well, that won't even work with some cartridges, so uh, I don't know what the rule of thumb is. When we ran the Plus P338 Edge, it was way less than 338 caliber inside the neck, and it shot just fine. So I think you're mostly limited there. If it doesn't look like it makes sense, it probably doesn't make sense. So make sure you have enough bullet in the neck to hold it firmly, uh, the other problem you might run into is it might be cocked a little bit because you don't have enough of it in there to hold it squarely in the case neck. Now, having said that, don't be afraid to jump the bullet. You don't have to have it close to the lance. When I started uh, the 260 Terminator project thing, that was a 260 Remington that was originally throated for 140 grain Amax fed out of a Wyatt's extended box magazine in a Remington short action. So my cartridge overall length and my cartridge based ogive length were matched perfectly to that combination. I decided I wanted to run a surgeon bottom metal with AI mags in it. So I took the Wyatt stuff out and the floor plate out. I put in a surgeon bottom metal like this and started running AI mags. Well now all of a sudden I can't get anywhere near my lands at that 2.820 or 830 that you can run in an AI mag. So I was running 140 grain VLDs, VLDs, you know, like from Burger, that everybody says you're supposed to jam into the lands. I was running those 200 thousandths off the lands, almost a quarter inch jump to get to my lands. And I shot it like that for 1,500 rounds. And that gun gave me more .1 and .2 five shot groups than I think any barrel since or before. So uh, don't get hung up on having to do something. This is all hands-on experimentation. Try it. See if it shoots well. Uh, the biggest thing that I have found with bullet seating depth is that every one of your rounds in a batch is the same CBTO. You want them to be as close as possible so that when the pressure curve of you lighting off that powder starts, those bullets are moving exactly the same amount every single time that that pressure curve starts. And that will give you yeah, very consistent burn that'll give you low ES, it'll give you good accuracy. Everything just works right that way. So that is way more important to me, at least, in my experience, than anything I've ever seen with specific jumps. So even though I like to go 10 thousandths off the lands, I don't have to if I'm not able to. In fact, I could pick a number between 10 and 20 of any given barrel that I've worked with, 10 to 20 thousandths off the lands, and I've never seen a difference, so keep that in mind. Anyway, I hope this video wasn't too long. I hope you guys got something out of it this time. If not, uh, leave comments down below the video, please, especially with your questions. Uh, the email, I'm having a hard time keeping up with all the emails, so if you guys could put your questions right in the comment section, that will give me a chance to give a quick answer to it, and there's a lot of guys out there that would love to answer you too, so uh, put them in the comment section whenever possible. Anyway, the next video up is going to be a detailed description of the build here for Jake's Rifle. Uh, this is basically a mirror image of what I built last year for that 
load development series. So anyway, that's our next project. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.